The views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. Tonight, the controller of this city of New York joins us and we have a full slate of issues to discuss with him, including how did the city do in the recently passed state budget? A study that shows potential for new housing on land the city already owns. A new red tape commission to help small businesses, the status of the Kingsbridge Armory, and much more. We are on tape tonight, so there won't be live phone calls, but if you'd like to ask questions or make comments, send us an email. BronxTalk at BronxNet.org is our address. You can post it on our Facebook page, and we'll read it on the air during a future edition of our program, and we'll get you an answer from the controller as appropriate. For the here and now, the controller of the City of New York, the Honorable Scott Stringer, welcome back to Bronx Talk. Great to be back on the show. Great to be in the Bronx again. Uh, and you say again because you were here recently for a town hall meeting. We're going to talk about that in a moment. But let's start with that uh, state budget. How did the city do? I mean, there was a lot of rancor beforehand. Um, how, how did it turn out? Do you feel comfortable with what you heard? Well, I'm very excited about the minimum wage. I commend Governor Cuomo for leading this effort in the state. It was not easy to negotiate with the Republicans at Albany, but at the end of the day, we have a $15 minimum wage for New York City, and I think it will do great things, not just for the Manhattan Central Business District, but as a report showed that I released a year ago, that when you have a $15 minimum wage, we actually will pump $10.5 billion into the New York City economy, which means that there will be more spending money in our various neighborhoods, which will help small businesses and also allow people to have a little breathing room, more money to pay for a child's, a child's clothing or more food to put on the table or to pay these exorbitant rents. Uh, also, we were very successful in making sure there were no cuts to CUNY, and I think that was something that was very significant for all the CUNY grads out there. And also, uh, there was no cut in Medicaid. So I think on balance, the city did very well and uh, it's on to next year. Uh, we'll talk uh, in detail about small businesses. As I mentioned, you had your red tape uh, um, uh, a project that um, we're going to mm. talk about. But I did talk to some small business owners who were saying, you know what, I don't want to have to pay another $15 an hour. Now they're forcing me to do something else mm -hmm. that, that you know, uh, uh, means me spending money and I'm getting hit from everywhere in sight. Um, what's your reaction to a small business owner who would say that? Well, I think that's a legitimate concern for a struggling small business. And that is why I established the Red Tape Commission. I brought together 31 people, small business owners, experts in, in, in financing of small businesses. And we held hearings in all five boroughs in the past year. We talked to hundreds of business owners. We surveyed another few hundred. And we listened to what the small business owners had to say. And what they were talking about was cutting the red tape of our city agencies. The bureaucracy is so prevalent with small businesses that they're just drowning in red tape. There's more red tape in small businesses. We could have 10 ticket tape parades. So my goal is to put forth, and we did this, put forth 60 recommendations how to make doing business easier with our city agencies that will save small businesses money and a whole host of recommendations so that businesses will be in a better position to support a minimum $15 minimum wage, which will give them employees with more loyalty. They will stay longer with the small businesses. And I think this could be a tremendous victory. So we support the $15 raise the wage, but we also have to smart, uh, support changes to make it easier to be a small business owner in New York City. I, I want to, uh, I'm, I'm going to move it up my priority list because we hadn't planned to talk about it, but this yeah, yeah. is the Red Tape uh, uh, Commission uh, report that was put out uh, by, by the um, uh, controller. Um, in the Bronx, we lost 
long-standing small businesses. It was a jewel, I mean, you may not be familiar with some of them, but a, a jewelry store in Bainbridge, a hardware store in Kingsbridge. Uh, uh, you might have heard about the, the controversy of Zaros that closed in Parkchester, yeah. all because of kind of this pressure that small businesses are on. On one hand, there is there are ways to cut the red tape, as you have uh, suggested, but many are saying, you know, the movement in the Bronx toward malls. We have malls, and, and I can recount them. There are many all over the borough. It's been somewhat of a trend in the borough, and that's how uh, we're getting hurt. Um, it, are the malls, is that a, a kind of a, a counterproductive movement because you're really, you know, generating jobs that are not life saving and, and ultimately going to be able to uh, have people well, feed their families uh, over it? Or, you know, w w where's the balance here, I guess, is what well, I'm Well, we didn't look at malls per se in this report. Even within malls, there are small businesses. And we really focused on what the city could do to enhance the ability of a small business owner to make it in the city, which is the ultimate goal. And part of what we looked at is this notion that small businesses have to hire expediters, which are middlemen, to interact with uh, their city agencies. I thought that made sense. They shouldn't be part of that. We should have small business advocates. Think about this. If you're a small business, you're a restaurant, and you want to get questions answered by the Department of Health, you actually have to pay them $400 for a consultation. Now, what does that say? I have to interject, sir. If, if you look at what, a, what product maybe a small business owner is selling, think of how much he's got to sell just to make that up before he even pays his workers or feeds his family or does other things to support the well, business. The, the, it's, it's, it's really an extraordinary thought. Well, these are the issues we identified. I mean, I give uh, Mayor de Blasio credit. We did another analysis. That's my job as controller is to let people know the, what's happening with the finances of the city. And we have reduced fines uh, against small business owners by 20 percent. And I think that's a credit to Mayor de Blasio and the administration. There's a lot of valuable programs that the uh, city has to assist our small business owners, restaurateurs and the like. But we have to do more. We have to take a sledgehammer to this bureaucracy. We can't let expediters and these fees and, and harassment of these small businesses dictate whether somebody will open or close. One of the things that's simply outrageous to me is there's no certainty of when a permit or a license will come due uh, so a business can't even st open up. So you're waiting for your license months and months, paying the rent, not knowing when you can start your business. Here's the problem. There's 6,000 rules related to small business operations in the city. There's 250 licenses that have to be acquired, depending on what kind of business you have. And it's spread across 15 city agencies. That is really extraordinary. And that's why we had the Red Tape Commission, and we want to cut the tape. Uh, let's go to the second issue you brought up in the state budget, uh, and that is uh, that we, you said they restored uh, the cuts to CUNY. What did you make of the governor's threat to cut a half a billion dollars out of well, CUNY? Do you think he was zinging the mayor a little bit? I, I think mean, he made it very clear that uh, the, no harm would come to the city, and no harm came to the city. So I hope that the mayor and the governor uh, will continue to work better together. And that's certainly uh, something that I hope for in the new year. And uh, I think the city budget resolution as we pass the state budget is a good sign. Posturing, maybe, on the governor's part? I'm not a political prognosticator. prognosticator. Right. I'm just a well, humble what, controller. What do you make also of Bernie Sanders and others who propose, um, as we used to have at CUNY when I went to um, the City Universities of New York, uh, free, free college and, or free community college. Is that realistic in this day and age? Well, I would have to see the numbers he's talking about. Uh, clearly, uh, there is a debate in this country over the amount of money it's costing to earn a college education. Uh, some estimates of leaving students with some $200,000 of debt uh, is, is something that's very troubling. We're going to be talking more about the millennial generation in the next week or two in a report I'm issuing, so you heard it here first. Okay. Because we want to make sure that the next generation will do better than the generation today. That has always been the aspiration of this country and of this city. And I think there are real challenges for young people today. The high cost of rent, the high cost of education, the fact that a lot of the jobs that we're creating in the city are low-wage jobs. They're jobs in retail and tourism. They don't pay a lot. So you can't really call this a career entry-level job that doesn't really lead to much. The good news is that we have 4 million jobs in the city. 
uh, more people are working than ever before, but we see a large uh, growth in low-wage jobs, and that's something that has to be addressed. And I think that is some of the great issues that the Democrats are debating as we speak. The Republicans obviously are debating nothing of note, but I do think there is a discussion with, uh, among Democrats about how we can end income inequality, how we can support our young people. We have to fight for communities in the Bronx that are suffering because gentrification is pushing the people out of the Bronx who built up the neighborhood. And as somebody who's, you know, went to John F. Kennedy High School and whose parents and grandparents are from the Bronx, my, my parents live here today, uh, this is a very exciting and important borough and the people who invested in this borough should be able to live here. You uh, came to the Bronx a week ago to hold a uh, town hall meeting at Bronx House. Uh, over on uh, Pelham Parkway. Uh, what did Bronxites uh, talk to you about? Uh, w did you get any surprises? Uh, or, or was it somewhat predictable? G give us a feel of what, what you heard from Bronxites. I thought that this meeting. was one of the best town hall meetings I've ever had. You know, when I was a state assemblyman, I used to have town hall meetings, borough president, I've had town hall meetings. As controller, we have town hall meetings. I don't pre-invite people. Everyone can come. I don't ask for questions in advance. And I have to tell you something, the, the Bronx residents who were there were right on, talked about affordable housing, talked about livability, quality of life issues, talked about pensions and the future financial security of the city. So it was a great, great town hall meeting. It was a huge turnout. And uh, I'm really looking forward to going back and spending more time listening to the people in the Bronx. Did you learn anything? And is there anything that you took away from there that you said, you know what, when you talk to your associates, some of whom are here in the room with us, and you said, you know what, that's something we ought to get started with. So I want to hear what Bronxites did that might have a You know, a lot of people were very interested in a housing proposal I have because they are worried about affordable housing. And I talked about our recent audit where we found that there were 1,100 uh, properties in the city that were vacant. Some have been vacant between 25 and 50 years. And I have a pro proposal to create a land bank for the Bronx and other places around the city that would allow us to lease some of these vacant city-owned properties to not-for-profit organizations to build permanent affordable housing. It's so hard to build housing f uh, for middle-income and working people, but it's almost impossible to have permanent affordable housing in the city, and we desperately need it. We have a homeless crisis where 58,000 people are going to sleep tonight in a shelter, 23,000 are children, so we need to build low-income permanent housing. So they were very intrigued and wanted to learn more about our plan that could complement the work that Mayor de Blasio is doing. Uh, leads right into the, the report that I have in front of me, and this and is, that is the, the report. That is it, Building an Affordable Future, the Promise of New York City Land Bank. So the idea is, and, and we all see them all over the Bronx, uh, that we have empty lots, and many of these lots are city-owned. What agencies control these lands? Because in many cases, they are, let's say, former school buildings, or maybe their parks department or whatever they are. I think that would possibly be the first level of uh, bureaucracy, if you will, that you've got to get through to turn that into housing. Now, a lot of it is HPD owned or, or operated, but uh, it doesn't matter what agency you're in. Let's have a discussion about how to leverage that vacant property with not-for-profit organizations. And again, we need to have different tools to deal with our housing crisis. We, I estimate that over the last 12 years, we've lost 400,000 affordable housing units that used to rent for $1,000 or less. So this is a true crisis. And in earlier times, Mayor LaGuardia created public housing, which in those days, this was the gateway to the middle class. Uh, years later, the Michelama housing program was created, which I think was the most creative and most important housing program ever devised. And now we need to have a larger Michelama II program that also meets the needs of the poorest people, but also keeps people in their communities. People who lived in the Bronx, I grew up in Washington Heights, I mean, there were neighborhoods where no one wanted to invest in, right? The banks weren't there, the speculators weren't there, but the people who moved into communities in the Bronx and Washington Heights, they built the neighborhoods, the schools, the daycare centers, the quality of life, the diversity. And now we have to figure how we make way for the next generations who come to our city, but we have to hold on to the people who are the pioneers of our communities.
Do you see these uh, houses being built? You, you mentioned the idea of uh, maybe uh, not-for-profits would run them, or do these uh, uh, become private developments? How do you see the bulk of them uh, being well, built? Uh, and, and let me just add, because of course private developers are saying, we can't do it at the price unless, uh, and, and build affordable housing because we don't get back enough to make it worth it. Well, look, our land bank proposal is to make it possible for not-for-profit uh, housing organizations to build housing um, that would be even more affordable than what we create today. And when you have land and you're leasing it to a not-for-profit, and the not-for-profit does not have to be a fiduciary to create value or profit for investors, then we can perhaps you know, build housing for the people who need it the most. And it's an idea, it's a report we put out. Attorney General Schneiderman is funding or seeding land banks around the state. I thought it'd be an interesting idea for New York. Uh, the um, uh, communities, Bronx communities, always are worried that somebody is going to take a piece of property that we have a community garden on it. And I know there's many community gardeners, and, and they, they certainly add a lot to the borough. Um, should they be worried that, uh-oh, now the city's going to come in and say we're taking back that property? Well, I hope not. I think there's enough room for everybody. We want to build affordable housing, but we also have to respect open space. The community gardens, I think, play an important role in terms of bringing healthy produce to communities and also giving our inner city the sense that we in fact you know or one you know also have green space and open space I think that's very important mm -hmm. uh, what did you make speaking of housing what did you make of the um, the mayor's zoning plans that were adjusted by the time it got through the council and passed by the city council. I, I, some of the feedback we've gotten on the program is that it was one size fits all. They didn't really take care to give communities a chance to really establish what's best for their individual neighborhoods. Your thoughts? Look, I think the best way to develop a housing plan is through consultation with the community. Even if you're going to be build controversial housing or luxury housing, whatever the proposal is, you have to go through the community boards, the land use process has to be taken seriously. And I do think that as part of the EULA process, you see what happened. Community boards raised concerns, Bronx Borough President raised concerns, and that's all to the good because the, there were a lot of changes made along the way. And we should always have a give and take with a mayor or a city council to make sure that we get the best deal possible for the community and for the overall goal. Did we get it right? Well, we'll did they get it right? Well, we'll, <laughs> well, listen, we'll find out. Building housing is very tough. Uh, the mayor's proposal is bold, and it's important to allow him the opportunity to put forth his vision. He's the mayor. But it's also important for local community stakeholders who've lived in the communities forever to also voice concerns. One of the legitimate concerns is, are we going to be able to build housing for the people who uh, are, are the poorest in the borough but who also have spent a lifetime in the Bronx. We don't want to displace people. We don't want to create more homelessness. And I think these are all issues that are legitimate and should be discussed. Uh, another report which I've got in front of me is making the grade and uh, we've been busy haven't we yeah, yeah apparently yeah. And, and your staff uh, made all the reports available this is the biggest of them this is the heaviest of them and this is about um, a minority and women owned business enterprises uh, we had a project uh, here that you're well familiar with that we studied on this program for years literally and that was the building of the uh, Croton water filtration plant mm -hmm. near here and despite the promises the glowing promises of job development and this will change the economy of the Bronx of course history has shown that it certainly did nothing of the sort but maybe most disturbing is the promise of uh, women and minority owned businesses to all benefit uh, from a project like that and it really was a mirage it never happened um, are we at a point now where we will no longer accept empty promises like that and that the city is really going to be able to use its procurement something was 13 billion dollars uh, so that the women and minority owned businesses can benefit well and a shout out to assembly member jeff dinowitz who identified the problems with that filtration plant years earlier and we should learn from that experience but Look, this report I issued is a yearly report, and what we're trying to do is make it easier for women and minority-owned businesses to do business with New York City. Right now, New York City spends $14 billion a year on procurement. We buy paper clips, pencils, we hire law firms, accounting firms. We're big, we're, we, we, we buy a lot of things. And of that $14 billion spend, 
only 5% of that is with women and minority owned businesses. So That's this, pretty scary. Well, this report breaks it down. It shows categories, African American, Latino, Asian. We actually go agency by agency and show the actual spending uh, with MWBs, women and minority owned businesses. And we rate the agencies based on that spend. So we gave the city a D last year. This year we gave the city a D plus. We'll <laughs> Well, but, I, but actually, no, but, but actually, I like the fact that we're moving in the right direction. Some agencies did better, some didn't. But now we now we now can do our analysis and fight to make sure that women and, and MWBs, women and minority-owned businesses, actually should be doing better. So, as controller who thinks about the finances of the city, I know that you, if you invest in MWBs, you're going to grow the economy throughout the city. You're going to give people a chance to hire locally. You're going to have a better Bronx. And we have to make sure that we take this issue seriously. How is it possible that we got to that point? Given the, the obvious demographic makeup of the city, uh, we know who the people are who reside in the city and who populate the city and who spend their money in the city and who own businesses in the city. How did we get to a point where we had only 5% of the 13 it's, or 14 billion dollars uh, spent uh, on you know women and because because we, we you know we we talk a lot about these issues but we don't actually get anything done and that's why I've been very aggressive on this issue I I want to make it very clear that we have to up our spending with uh, MWB businesses it is critical for the economic growth of our city it's something I've championed since I've been a uh, controller. I know I'm ruffling a lot of feathers in agencies, uh, grading agencies, but my attitude is if you can grade a restaurant, surely you can grade a city agency on their spending with, uh, with people of color and different, uh, you know, and, and different businesses. And what's the recommendation for change? How do we change that? Well, we have uh, a number, we, we've been working for the last two years on a number of initiatives. We have a vendor roadmap initiative. You can go online and see that from my office we're working with the city to try to give them our recommendations and it's an ongoing process and as you know when I became controller I think I talked about this last time I was on the show for the first time I hired the city's first chief diversity officer she operates out of the controller's office her name is Carol Wallace there's a deputy Wendy Garcia and their job is to work with women and minority owned businesses and get them to where they have to be so they can not just asked to do business with the city, but that their businesses will be ready-made to do to work with city agencies. And at the same time, we're holding city agencies accountable. If you want to have a fair and just city, if you want to end income inequality, you also have to make sure that while you're raising the minimum wage, which is crucial, that's step one, you also have to create business opportunities for all people of all different backgrounds. And our strength as a city is the fact that we, spe we speak 170 different languages from 200 countries. Look at the Bronx and the diversity in the Bronx. And yet, if we're not investing in the businesses in the Bronx, then how do you grow the economy in the Bronx? It, it would seem to be totally logical that the city invest in its own people, if I can phrase it a different way. Um, speaking of investment, uh, the um, not too far from where we are sitting is uh, the Kingsbridge Armory. Many people, I've looked at that uh, property for decades, literally, and uh, most recently said, you know what, there's hope here. We, we now have the, the, it's been signed off by just about everybody, uh, the Kingsbridge National Ice Center, but the reports now show that the city's EDC is holding up the project because they say the proper funding is not in place. Do you think it is, in fact, not in place, and are they doing the right thing, or is maybe this part of some politicking between the mayor and borough president? How do you evaluate where we are at with that project that many people would like to see it get started? Well, I think it's a very exciting project, and I commend Mark Messier and, and Borough President Diaz for putting it forth. We haven't done an analysis of the financing, uh, so I can't comment on the EDC analysis. But I do hope that the city, the mayor, and the borough president, and everybody can come together and, and get something done. I think it would be mm -hmm. very positive for that area, for the armory, and, uh, and for you know, the kids, the young people in the Bronx, which is what it's all about. Young and old. And that raises another question, which almost cycles back to our original discussion about small businesses, and that is the idea about uh, gentrification. Here's something that could uh, potentially do very, very well in the Bronx. I mean, it's been evaluated by any number of people. But there are 
um, uh, commercial uh, property owners not too far, like on, from here on Kingsbridge Road, that are saying, you know what, if this is coming, I'd rather not have this business. I think I can make more. They shorten the lease. They raise the rents. They do whatever they can. And somebody, as you said earlier, who has invested in the Bronx, who, you know, we stay, Nos Kedamos, has stayed in the Bronx and decided this is where they want to be with their families, all of a sudden finds out I can't own a business right when things are getting better. Is there a way to solve that um, inequity, if you will? Well, listen, this is the challenge of urban planning, and it goes to making sure that city government listens to the will of the people on the block, listening to the community boards, the local small business community, the bids. I think it's all about devising a community plan that protects the people who have invested in the Bronx before all the gentrification, before the change has come, and make sure that we create balanced communities. And I think that's doable, and I know uh, the, my colleagues in the Bronx, so the borough president, the local elected officials, I know are working very hard on that. The most recent uh, report uh, you put out is this, uh, which actually was, I don't know, 24 hours ago <laughs> practically, uh, the voting reform in New York City, uh, barriers to the ballot, what you call, um, uh, I guess, uh, a way of looking at access to uh, uh, the, the ballot box. Uh, we had an election here for, it was a special election for city council in the 17th uh, district. Uh, something like 3% or less than 3% of eligible voters came out to vote for something as important as a council member. Uh, where are we at and how do we improve uh, voting access? We have about 60 seconds for you to attack that. Well, that immense well, problem. Go well, right ahead. Well, barriers to the ballot, this report is, pu is putting together 16 proposals to help people get to the polls. Same day voter registration, giving people different options, early voting, uh, a whole set of, of, of new ideas to make it easier for New York State to get people out. Right now in 2014, we, we were 48 out of 50 in terms of voter turnout for a statewide election. It's outrageous. We've got one of the most important uh, elections, in the presidential election I that's in a generation. And yet we worry about voter turnout. And so we can't force people to vote, but we should help them make it easy. And give, just before we run out of time, give me one example of something you think that will Same help. day voter registration. There you go. So you don't have to wait three months and you miss a deadline. You want to vote? Vote. Uh, Get kids to register uh, early so when they're 18, they're good to go. Comptroller uh, Scott Stringer, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you again. much for coming to the Bronx. We want you here as often as we can get you and back on the program as well. Thank you. Thank you. Folks, if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on the show or anything going on in the Bronx, you can email them to us at bronxtalk at bronxnet.org. You can put them on our Facebook page, and we'll read them on the air during a future edition of our program. As I said, we will also forward questions to the controller and get you an answer as appropriate. We ask you to like Bronx Talk on Facebook. Our archives are at bronxnet.org. Bronx Talk is on the lower right navigation bar. Now, next week, a very special show. All our shows are special. Uh, we haven't done this in about, <laughs> we haven't done this in about 20 years. We will have a studio audience here in the studio comprised of students from Truman High School and they will ask questions of our guest, their councilman, Andy King. Should be fun and interesting program. And speaking of fun, the week after on April 18th, it will be baseball. Baseball in the Bronx. The opening of the season is always exciting in the Bronx. We'll be presenting a new baseball book written by a Bronxite. The book is about Ralph Kiner and the old show Kiner's Corner. They're telling me I gotta say good night. Good night. See you next week.